Making a cell shaded cartoon you look like you're seeing before you right now is actually much easier than it might at first look like. This is what the original render from the engine looks like, and then when we go all the way down here, this is what a fully cell shaded version looks like. With this material, we'll have a control over where the highlights cut off, where the shadows start, the actual darkness of the shadows and the darkness of the midtones as well. So let's get into it. We'll start off by making a new material and calling it uh, cell post processing. In the material, we'll choose the material domain to be post processing. And then scrolling all the way down, we'll get this here. Blendable location will change from after tone mapping to before tone mapping. Your preview will be entirely black and the only output you'll have in your material is the emissive color. First thing we're going to get is a scene texture. And in the scene texture ID, you have a lot of different options, right? So we're going to go for post-processing input zero. This is literally just the information that the engine renders out from the normal lighting. With post-processing materials, I generally find that this uh, shaded sphere doesn't really show what I'm working on. So what I end up doing instead oftentimes is I go into my post-processing volume and I just put in the material that I'm working on right there. So you can see and we plugged in the scene texture and this is just the normal lighting from our scene because we haven't done anything to it yet. Before we start making our post-processing system, I'm going to show you a little bit of theory on how cartoon shading works. So over here we have Goku, a very good example of three-tone shading in this image. So if we take a look at a skin color, we can actually see that the skin color is there in three different brightness values. We have his normal skin color, then we have a darker version of his skin color, and we have a lighter version. The same can be said in his hair, for instance. We have got this gray silvery bit, then we have the shadows bit, and then we have the highlights. But for the most part, every color that you're seeing in this design has two or three different brightness values. That's what we're going to be emulating with this shader as well. So it's very important that your textures support this. Your textures are going to have to be the brightest value out of these three. So if we were to make this Goku as a 3D model to then shade with this technique, we would make his entire skin this highlight color. You can paint in some actual shadows onto the model itself in the texture if you want to make sure that certain parts are always a little bit darker than others but by and large you're going to stick to very flat colors now with that bit of theory out of the way how do we actually accomplish that well we can uh, copy this scene texture over and change it from post processing input zero to being the base color I'll show you what that does real quick. If we put that into the emissive color, you can see all the shading information is gone. We just have the base colors to work with. From here, we can actually start making our own shading based on the rendering that the engine does. We're going to use the actual output render from the post-processing input zero as a sort of mask to apply different shades of our base color. So the way we do that is we start by desaturating it because we don't need to know specifically about a red, green or blue channel, we just want overall brightness information. And then we'll also add two division nodes down here as well, which will take in the base color into the A slots, and then we'll have two scalar parameters for the B slots. We're going to uh, call the first one midtone, and then we're going to copy and paste it, and we're going to call this one shadows which will both be hooked up into the division nodes as well. So the output from this is going to be the highlights. The output from this is going to be our midtones and the output from this is going to be our shadows. So what values are we going to divide this by? A general rule of thumb, which will look good in most cases is for the midtones to be divided by three and then the shadows to be divided by five. But now how do we decide which parts are the highlights, which parts are the midtones, and which parts are the shadows. This is the tricky bit, right? Coming off our desaturation node, we're going to put in an if node. If you have some programming experience, this will probably look somewhat familiar to you. What this does is you give it an A value and a B value, and then three possible outputs. And then for every pixel on the screen, it will compare the A value and the B value, and this output will be one of these three 
depending on the answer to that comparison. So we're going to put in another scalar parameter here and we're going to call it highlight range. Uh, let's put that by default at 0.7 and that will be our B value. So what we're doing for every pixel in the scene, we're desaturating it, and then we're comparing the brightness level to 0.7. So everything that's over 70% bright will result in A is bigger than B. If something is exactly 70% bright, it will be A equals B. If it's lower than 70% bright, we'll get A, A is less than B. Since we're doing highlights here, and this is our highlight color, if A is bigger than B, we want our highlight color as the output. If A is equal or less to B, we actually want a output of zero. So we just hold one, pressing the left mouse button, we'll get a parameter, and it's by default zero, and that's exactly what we need as well. So right now we have a mask that only shows off the highlight. So if we plug that into the emissive color real quick and we apply that, you can see that everything is pure black except the things that are over 70% brightness. And we'll actually end up doing something similar for the midtones and the shadows. So we can just copy the scalar parameter and the if node. We'll change this to being the shadow range and we'll set this to 0.3. Also hook up the desaturated scene into the A port. But here we're going to make a slightly different consideration. Because what we want here is everything that is lower than 0.3 is going to be shadows, and everything else is going to be the midtones. We'll then later subtract the highlights from this output uh, so that we can add these two together. So if A is less than B, we want shadows, and otherwise we want the midtones. Let's plug this into the emissive color just to check what that looks like. And now we can see we have two-tone shading. If you just want two-tone shading, by the way, this is all you need to do. You don't need to bother with highlight colors or whatever. You can just do this all within one if node. But now we need to subtract the highlights from this because if we add these two things together right now, I can show you, don't do this, uh, but we'll end up having some colors clipping and uh, being pure white. So as you can see, for instance, over here, we have a little bit of a highlight, which is, uh, I can just go towards it actually, uh, which is way, way, way too bright. And that's because it's actually calculating the brightness for these areas twice. It's doing once for the midtones, and then it's adding the highlights on top of that. We don't want that. So what we'll do instead is we'll disconnect this if node, uh, copy it over, and then again, the desaturated scene is going to be the A, and then the highlight range is going to be the B. And if A, the scene, is brighter than B, the highlight range, then we just pull off this zero, then we'll return zero. If it's equal to or smaller than, we get the midtone or shadows. And then this if node itself uh, will decide whether or not it's actually one or the other. So plugging this into the addition node now, that will give us our fully cell shaded look. And you'll see this is no longer overexposed and we have our three tone shading. The last step here is to add a linear interpolate node, also known as a loop node, and add in and take the output from this into the B, take the original scene into the A, copy over and make another scalar parameter, calling it blend that'll go into the alpha. This is very important, the slider max will be one, slider minimum will be zero, and that then goes into the emissive column so that we can actually, once back in here, uh, uh, make a material instance, we can just call that cell PP inst, put that into our post-processing volume instead, and now when we open up this, we get a window in which we can actually change around these parameters. So if we go all the way to zero blend, this is the original scene render. One blend is the cell shaded version. And then we can start playing with the highlight range. So the lower we put that, the more highlights we'll have. And then the shadow range, the lower we put that, the less shadows we'll have and the more midtones will become available. Then if we increase the value for the shadows, the shadows will become darker. If we decrease it, it'll become lighter. The same goes for the midtones. If we wanted to have a little bit darker effect, you can actually even make the midtones darker than the shadows if you want to, for whatever reason. Generally, I don't see a reason that you would, but you definitely can do that. 
And then once you're happy with the shading, you can dial in the blending a little bit to make it a little bit less harsh, if that's what you're looking for. You can also just keep it at one and just have it purely only cell shaded. And then if we play around, you can see we it's almost like we're playing The Legend of Zelda Wind Waker, isn't it? Uh, I also <laughs> still have the Material Instance window um, blocking my view, so that's not great for gameplay purposes. One more thing that you might want to do is adding some outlines. That's a little bit too much to get into for this video, but in the next video we'll be talking about how to make outlines around your character and every object in a post-processing volume as well.